Today's topic is decolonizing the Indian mind for the study of Dharma. The Hindu community has undergone double colonization and it has been colonized for about a thousand years. And the nature of colonization always is such that it leaves a deep impression on the psyche of the people, on the psyche of the colonized. After independence, some efforts have been made to understand the economic impact of colonization. Of course, we know that a massive grain of wealth happened from India, which led to the prosperity of Britain. And one of the pioneers in this particular project was Dada Bhai Nagaji, long time ago. So we have a tradition of understanding the economic impact of at least British colonization. The impact of Muslim colonization has yet not been studied. But today, I am not going to look at colonization from an economic perspective, but I am going to look at it from a cultural as well as psychological perspective. And the beginning point of this analysis is actually very simple. <clears throat> it's very simple, but it has profound implications. And it basically begins from understanding the nature of dualities. Dualities like right and wrong, true and false, mountains and valleys, and so on and so forth. If you would look at the classical Indian traditions, whether it is Vedanta, Hinduism, or Jainism, you will find that dualisms and dualities have been critically examined. And what is the reason? The reason is that an ordinary mind thinks that every dualism, every binary, every dichotomy consists of discrete entities. Usually in our consciousness, we think that true is true, false is false, and in ordinary pursuit of knowledge, we need to find out what is true and right and distinguish it from what is untrue and false. This is the pursuit of ordinary knowledge. The classical Indian traditions say that this is avidya. This is not vidya. And what is the reason that they give? They say that true and false do not exist in isolation. I'll go about this point very, very slowly, but it is a very crucial point when it comes to understanding the Indian traditions, the spiritual traditions from within. So I'm going to take it up very, very slowly. So they say that you cannot conceptualize true without false, right without wrong, day without night, mountains without valleys, if one goes away, 
the other goes away too. So they are basically interconnected. They are mutually dependent. They are contingent on each other. They are not separate. Mahayana Buddhism calls this principle as Pratitva Samudhapad. And the interesting thing is that the moment mind begins to understand this, it begins to notice this, then the transcendence of the mind begins to happen. Not only that, ego begins to become humble as well. What is the reason? The reason is that in the Vedantic conception, mind is not a singular entity. It consists of at least four different sublevels. Mind is called Antahkaran. And what are its four characteristics or sublevels? It has Chitta, it has Manas, it has Buddhi, and Ahankara. I am not going to go into those details, it will become very technical. But I will focus on Buddhi and Ahankara. Buddhi basically is the discerning quality which is within us. It is that which makes us discern and discriminate between things. Now look at the choice of words. The moment I say that it helps us discriminate between things. Which basically means that it essentially operates in dualities and binaries. And very closely associated with buddhi is your ahankara. <coughs> So the moment you begin to go beyond the binaries, the moment you begin to go beyond the dualities, the moment you begin to go beyond right and wrong, true and false, day and night and so on and so forth, you begin to transcend your buddhi or your antahkaran. Correspondingly, you begin to make your ego humble as well. And because they are interconnected, either you can make your ego humble to transcend your buddhi or make your buddhi flexible in order to transcend your ego. Now what is the rationale behind this? Why do we really need to do this? The saints since time immemorial in India have said, the Rishis, that there are many levels and layers of consciousness beyond mind, which an ordinary individual, an ordinary human being is not able to experience. But it is there. And all these layers and levels of consciousness is operating on us. It is working on us. But these levels, they are not abstract. They are only abstract for the normal consciousness. Ordinary consciousness. This consciousness in which we are living at this point in time. But if we begin to make efforts, if we be, begin to engage in certain spiritual practices, certain sadhanas, then we will be able to transcend our mind and experience those layers of consciousness which the rishis, munis, sages experience on a day-to-day -day basis. This experiencing of this reality 
is extremely important from the Indian perspective because it is that which has given basis to our cosmology, our culture, our living, everything. So we can say that there is a level of reality which is beyond mind. Those levels transcend and integrate the mind. I am sure that many of you are engaging in certain spiritual practices. A good part of those practices is basically to silence your mind. Why do we need to do that? We need to do that basically to experience that reality. When it comes to experiencing that, the Indian traditions become extremely scientific in nature. But not scientific in the conventional sense. Why do I say this? In conventional science, what you use is, four, is your five senses. Your five senses to experience a particular nature of reality. That nature of reality, science says, is verifiable and reproducible. This scientific knowledge that I am talking about is verifiable and reproducible as well. But it gets experienced by subtle senses. The senses which are beyond your gross five senses. So in that sense, it is extremely scientific, though not in the conventional sense. So you see, that we begin with transcending the mind and as we transcend the mind, we get to the very crux or core of the Indian reality. That Indian reality which has been fashioned through spiritual experiences. And as a core of that, transcendence of dualities, dichotomies, binaries are extremely important. So on, on one hand, you have the classical Indian tradition which emphasizes this through and through. You know, when you look at the plethora of traditions that we have, there are differences. It's not that the differences are not there, but there is one commonality which you will find in all spiritual traditions, and that is the transcendence of mind and transcendence of duality. Now let's come to this part of the world. In this part of the world, there was one profound mystic who was crucified. Christ. And the day he was crucified, the mystical knowledge also got, got crucified. And when the mystical knowledge got crucified, mind never got transcended. And when mind did not get transcended, dualities, binaries, dichotomies, they did not get transcended. I will not get go into the philosophical details, but if you really look at 2000 years of the Western philosophic, uh, philosophical and historical tradition, you will find that this tradition has operated on binaries and dualities. I have spent a lot of time researching this to come to this conclusion. So I am not 
saying through the hat at this point in time, I have, I have substantial research on this. To make the matters very simple, let me give you some examples, some very profound <coughs> examples of dualities and dichotomies that operate in this part of the world, which have had a profound influence on the knowledge pursuit. You must have heard of the science religion dichotomy, mind body dichotomy, religion and science, mind and body, God and world, reason and emotion, soul and body. These are some of the important binaries around which the Western system actually works. And what happens is that the moment a binary is encountered, then there is one half of the binary which gets privileged and the other gets suppressed. This can become slightly technical, so let me give you some examples. Let me take you to Christendom. In Christendom, you had the God-World dichotomy. At that point in time, God was privileged and the world was suppressed. That is the reason medieval Christianity was extremely otherworldly in its orientation. You had reason and faith dichotomy. Faith was privileged and reason was demonized and it was suppressed. It was really looked down upon. Reason meant eating the fruits from the, from the Garden of Eden, which would basically mean damnation of an individual. So there was such a fear of reason. So these were two very, very profound binaries or dichotomies which were operating at that point in time. Now, Renaissance happened. And Renaissance was a period which lasted for about 200 years. And what was happening in that Renaissance? Some of these very profound binaries or dichotomies, they were being reversed. So God was here, the world was here, the world was, rep was, was repressed, God was privileged. Gradually, God started coming down, the world started gaining prominence. Similarly with reason and faith. Faith was here, reason was here, reason started coming up, faith started going down and in this process many people were burned at stake. They had a huge price to pay. At the culmination of Renaissance, what did you have? You had enlightenment, the period of enlightenment. And most of the halves of the binaries which were privileged in Christendom were brought up and what was privileged was brought down. This is the seesaw which has been going on in the Western world for a very long period of time and it is continuing even now, even as we speak. The reason this has not been critically examined is because mystical knowledge has been persecuted in this part of the world. Mysticism or spirituality has always remained on the margins. It has not been allowed to come into the very center. There have been movements like countercultural revolution and romanticism, 
when mysticism or spirituality from different parts of the world have been imported. But this very core of the binaries have really not been interrogated. It has been seen from an emotional perspective. So the, the idea is that if you are an individual who has a good heart, then in this part of the world you will be considered spiritual. But when you look at the Indian tradition, of course the heart is important because the heart, the heart gives rise to what is called as bhav. I won't translate that. But right behind that heart is what Sri Aurobindo calls as the psychic being. It is the spark of the divine which is within you. It can be represented as soul. And the whole idea of certain spiritual traditions is to basically bring that divine spark which is within and as that spark comes out, it transforms not only your heart but even your mind. So this level of consciousness is again beyond your reason and your heart. And if heart and reason can be equated, you can see that there is another dichotomy which is operating here, the reason-emotion dichotomy. So many of these revolutions, so to speak, the counterculture revolution or, or romanticism, again inverted that binary divide. Emotion got privileged, reason got suppressed. And that is the reason you will find a very strong strain of anti-intellectuality in this part of the United States. People from the East Coast do not take scholars from this part of the United States very seriously. They are called tree huggers. Why is that? The reason has been denounced. Mind has been denounced. Mind has not really been incorporated. Now, this difference separates India from the rest of the world and definitely from western part of the world. It's very important to note this. In being different, Mr. Raji Malhotra talks about this difference a little bit. He talks about the dichotomies and the dualities. But he doesn't go into, you know, how the dichotomies and dualities actually operate. By the grace of the divine, you know, those, are, those have been uh, my observations. And the operation of these binaries have given rise to 12 theorems. I have shared some of those theorems with you. I will be writing about those theorems in my forthcoming books. Uh, one of them I'm working on. It should be over in, in the next few months. Now, what does binary and dichotomy have to do with colonization? Let us come to that. If you will interrogate, you'll find that there is a very intimate relationship between colonized and colonizer. Again, there is a binary divide. If you have colonized, you have colonizer as well. Now, in order for a colonizer to raise himself or herself, it is important that the colonized is demeaned, is told that he or she is, inf is inferior, is told that he or she is savage, is told that he or she is barbaric, is told that he or she is absolutely uncivilized 
as far away from civilization as possible. So what happens in this process is that the process of colonization creates two fictions, two very important fictions. One is the fiction of the colonized and the other one is the fiction of the colonizer. Now when we are talking about two fictions, it is extremely important that we interrogate these two fictions. And the interrogation of these two fictions will basically lead to our decolonization. There is another thing which is in operation. When binaries are not transcended, then the colonizer keeps the privileged part of the binary and projects the suppressed part of the, of the binary to the colonized. Let me give you some examples. In the binary of reason and emotion, Europe, across the board, kept reason for itself. If there was ever where play of reason has ever happened, that was only in Europe, beginning with Greece, nowhere else. So from this perspective, what's our philosophy? Our philosophy is basically poetic, imaginative, metaphysical, imaginary, divorced from reason, divorced from reality. I am not making this up. This is part of the colonial scholarship. Let's talk about religions. So you have this binary of monotheism and poly polytheism. Monotheism for Christianity, poly polytheism for Hinduism. And polytheism gets demonized. First of all, it does not get represented by polytheism. And when it gets represented, it basically gets demonized and suppressed. Why do I say that, you know, that it doesn't get represented properly? Even when you take the Western terms, you will find that the Indian traditions are simultaneously monotheistic and polytheistic. Why? The Vedantic conception says that there is nothing but one. And it is that one which basically manifests in different gods and goddesses. And not only that, it has unfolded itself in so many ways that everything animate or inanimate is nothing but that one. So this whole idea, this entire Vedantic notion that gets completely suppressed. It, it is taken away from the view of the people. What is put out is polytheism. And then the gods and the goddesses are caricatured. This has been part of that colonial exercise. And reams and reams of paper have actually been written on these concepts. And when you have such scholarship that has been constructed you will find that they become part of universities. They get a life of their own. They continue to get recycled year after year and they, became, and they become veritable facts 
received knowledge which is very hard to refute so this is the this is the colonial construction of knowledge which happened because of the operation of binaries as far as india is concerned now there is a particular thing which colonization does which is that it makes you internalize the colonial discourse it is almost as if your mind is dyed in a dye the dye is there your mind is put into it it acquires that color and you become so one with it that you are not able to critically examine it till you develop the capacity that you can separate yourself from your own mind and look at the constructions of your mind and as i said at the very beginning of this talk that is almost a yogic exercise and from all the people who have been involved in sadhana they would ratify that this is not an easy process distinguishing oneself from the mind and taking a critical look at one's own mind is one of the most difficult things to do so if you think that a large population a large indian population is actually going to deconstruct these things in this way i don't think it is going to happen but what can definitely happen is that you have to change the discourse on india which has been constructed within the colonial period and for that there has to be some starting points for me the critical examination of the binaries was a starting point so how am i going about it i can only share my own experience with you i'm looking at the post colonial literature at this point in time that will allow me to go into the colonial scholarship on india that is one part of it now once that is done then i need to get into the historical records of india before the british colonization happened the the, the records are scattered fortunately travelers have been visited india they have been visiting india for a very long period of time and they have left records here and there so all those records will have to be read and with a very critical eye i will need to see what was in existence and what was what was not in existence now there's another very important thing given that india in ancient times was a civilization which gave a lot of capital to intellect it was also a very textual tradition so most of the things or most of the behavioral patterns that even you see in india at this point in time predominantly in rural india have some representation in some shastra or the other so all those shastras will have to be taken out so on one hand you will have to say that this is colonial scholarship this was constructed this was constructed because you know it was framed in certain operation of binaries now look at let's look at some of the earlier texts the earlier the, the texts before the coming of the europeans and see if the representation has been proper or not that will help us distinguish 
the misrepresentation. Then there is another aspect which I emphasized at the beginning of talk once again. It has always been spirituality which has given birth to the Indian civilization. So most of the scholars who are involved in this process, they will need to be doing some sadhana or the other, so that they begin to connect with that force, which will help them recover the ancient spirit of India. It is basically on the foundation of that spirit that this reconstruction of knowledge can happen which will basically decolonize the mind. It is a very, very difficult task. It is a very difficult task because in India, the better you learn and speak English, the further you are away from the tradition. And if you are really interested in bringing out the traditions, it becomes a very, very painful and a tortuous process of recovering that spirit. Because that spirit, that knowledge is lying under layers and layers of suppression. All those layers have to be recovered gradually. It is almost like peeling off the onion and finding what is at the core. But there is one thing which is certain. That core is extremely transformative. It is extremely transformative for an individual. And I am certain that it will be extremely transformative for the civilization. At this point in time, for all the people who are interested in this, I think we need to draw inspiration from some sage or the other. Connect with the spirit of that sage because it will be only he or she who will be able to guide us through this process. This is also a very intuitive process. But an intuitive process which is based on evidence because you do get evidence. Let me, on this note, let me talk about another characteristic of the Indian tradition. The Europeans told us that our philosophy is anti-rational, anti-reason, but that's not true. However, it is true that we have not put an absolute pre premium on reason since time immemorial. You know, one of the Upanishads says, neither your mind nor speech will be able to take you there. So it is clear that mind and reason within the Indian tradition will not be able to take you to the ultimate source of knowledge. However, the tradition definitely says that once you get that knowledge, then you can, re then you can use your reason to the hilt to manifest it. And that is the reason the Indian tradition, the classical Indian tradition also has been rigorously intellectual. There have been many rishis who have left us with beautiful prose and poetry. So reason within the Indian tradition is transcended and included. It is not the ultimate, but it has not been denied, it has not been decried. So what is the whole idea? The idea is to go beyond reason and use the reason. In fact, I would like to say that if we use reason to the hilt, then reason itself begins to give us the secrets of its own transcendence. When you use reason to the hilt, 
Reason itself will help you transcend your own reason. And once you get to that, then you will be able to use your reason. And it's from there that the process of decolonization will begin. One of the last points which I want to make is that for this process, it is extremely important that a good partnership between community and scholars should happen. The decolonization of the Indian mind is a very systematic and a rigorous process. It is very technical and it requires a one-pointed dedication. Just like a one-pointed dedication is required to acquire accomplishments in any field. So all the people who have made their accomplishments in different fields, they need to come together. If there are people who have generated a lot of wealth, they need to come together. They need to form a body and start supporting the scholars. Start finding the scholars, picking and choosing the scholars and supporting them. And there's another thing which I want to say. Indians will have to get beyond crab mentality. It is very important that when we see some light in someone, particularly in this field, then we try not to pull that person down. We welcome that individual with open arms and tell him or her that he or she is going to be a friend in this struggle. We need to form bonds across differences. I like to say that we need to have unanimity in purpose and diversity in ways. We have to go back, you know, to the Vedantic tradition. Vedanta talks about oneness, but it never compromises on diversity and plurality. On the contrary, it tells us to celebrate diversity and plurality. The Western mind is not able to wrap its head around the tremendous diversity and plurality that, we, that they find in India. What is the basis of this? Our, the basis is our spirituality. Sages after sages have said this and they have put this in our DNA. Yeah, we are one of the most liberal people. That comes from the conscious or the unconscious working of this profound philosophy which operates on the Indian psyche. In fact, culture almost always operates in very subtle ways, in unconscious ways. It's very much there. We need to tap into that. We need to get into that resource and make a very, very concerted effort towards this. This is not going to be an easy exercise. One wave of colonization destroyed our universities. The other replaced whatever was left. How do you begin? In fact, I would want to talk about the horrific history that we as Hindus have experienced over a period of time. Not to promote xenophobia, that's not the idea. That's definitely not the idea. 
I will do that because Hinduism encapsulates some of the best principles which the world will always benefit from. In fact, it has benefited from it for a very, very long period of time. It is based on that. When I talk about my emancipation, when I talk about my, disempower my empowerment, it is not at the disempowerment of someone else. We can celebrate empowerment of a lot of people, including the Hindus, who have been colonized and dominated pretty brutally for a very long period of time. On that note, I would like to end and would like to take some more questions. Thank you. So, um, if anyone has any questions, um, you can come forward ask your question. Uh, please be very specific uh, we, uh, so that you know, more people can ask uh, questions. <coughs> so please avoid uh, leaving any comments, uh, agreements, or any uh, straight to the questions. Sometimes Nidhanji comments are important to frame the questions. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> I would just like to thank uh, which are the team for organizing this very thoughtful source. My question is, you said two things, two very important things and um, uh, one, uh, first thing you said that this is, uh, all this beauty is hidden under layers and layers of colonization. And at the same time, you threw light upon how wonderful it is and how directly it is useful. Now, if this is directly useful, why do we have to go through the colonization layer? Why don't we directly access and explain the text as you were mentioning that there are a large number of these texts. We recover these texts. We uh, start bringing around, sure there needs to be a discussion, but why does it have to be a very painful journey where, which has to go through the, uh, you know, peeling the layers of us. Yeah. That is basically because of <clears throat> the process of colonization which we have undergone, Ashutoshji. What it does is that it dents our psyche <clears throat> and destroys our self-confidence. So this is a process of recovering our self-confidence too. You know, Ego operates in two ways. Either it asserts itself or it has a very poor understanding of itself. It deals with issues of self-esteem. When I look at the ego of India at this point in time, because of the colonial process that it has undergone, it has issues of self-esteem and that is the reason a lot of educated people in India, they do their best to actually distinguish and remove themselves from culture. They remove themselves from language, they remove themselves from the dress. I do not know about you, but you know, I can definitely speak for myself. Was the process conscious when it was happening? I don't think so. Growing up, what is it that we are seeing? We were seeing the West as the repository of all knowledge, all civilization, everything beautiful and, and, and wonderful. The discourse was not there. At least in the universities, it was not there. It was present in homes. 
what did it create for me it created a split in my own psyche it tormented my soul because in my early 20s i was not able to distinguish what was right and wrong because i was getting two conflicting messages one coming from a very traditional upbringing based in spiritual practices of some of my very close family members and on the other hand growing up in delhi university where if one studies sanskrit that individual is really looked down upon if a woman studies hindi then she is called banji this was at least 20 years ago i'm sure it happens now also none of the languages really have the prestige that they deserve based on the history the britishers have infected that air with a continued misinformation on the inferiority of our culture and, and language and what has happened in the process is that we have internalized it we did not critically examine it at least after independence and because that discourse remained in the universities it was fed to us in conscious and unconscious ways so in order to change the entire process the education has to be changed and i am not saying that you know this should happen at the expense of all the wonderful things which are coming from the west i am not saying that definitely not that is not the indian spirit that is not the vedantic spirit the vedantic spirit is to take the best from every nook and cranny of the world subsume it within your own consciousness and transform it by the dint of your spiritual practice and power that is what it is but then within this process we also need to understand that there are certain cultures that posit themselves against us and try to destroy us if the destruction is at bay then resistance needs to happen but that resistance should not happen with hatred it should happen based on the confidence of one civilization and knowledge and again i would say that it should not happen based on <coughs> any kind of parochialism or any kind of xenophobia it is something like this when you respect your own parents you don't have to demean the parents of someone else right you can talk about your parents and at the same time celebrate the parents of others as well so if we really break it down to that this is the approach that i am talking about i am talking about the recovery of the indian spirit without demeaning the spirit of other civilizations contrasting it that is part of the academic process that is part of the the critical thinking which is involved in this that is perfectly fine but not beyond that because ultimately we do need to keep this idea and ideal in front that the world is our family and we have to take the best from every nook and cranny of the world does that address your question as a part of uh, decolonization of indian mind 
what reflection do you see in happening as a part of this process in the physical world in India and also outside India? And when this process is complete, what do you see in the world overall, in the physical world? See, Sandeepji, the, the way I see it is that a complete and a very good understanding of Western cosmology and Western literature at this point in time is extremely important. Why do I say this? The people who are managing the consciousness of India at this point in time, they converse in this language and some of them are familiar with the Western thinkers. And when these Western thinkers are thrown at us, we really do not have a response. So what is the response? First, you'll have to master, master the Western cosmology and, and, and the Western thinkers so that you can start a dialogue and conversation with some of these people who are actually holding the consciousness of India hostage. Not to defeat them, but to transform them. Let's say, for instance, they throw some thinker at you. And you say, okay, you know, I understand your perspective fully well. Here is an alternative which I'm offering. And this alternative which I'm offering transcends and integrates the one that you are giving. That will be your intellectual strength. So in India at this point in time, a lot of intellectual sadhana is, 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 is important. You know, people have been talking about in intellectual shatriyahut. Intellectual shatriyahut will only happen, you know, it's like if the, the quote-unquote intellectual brahminhood has happened. Which basically means, and I'm going by, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using the varna system in, in, in terms of the gunas, not in, you know, uh, the form in which it's prevalent today. So mastery of that body of knowledge, that is extremely important. And I'm pretty much sure if you are able to converse with these in intellectuals in their own language, then it is highly possible that you will be able to open a few doors for transformation. Does that yeah. answer your question? Yes, sir. Please come. Anybody else want to ask questions? Please come over here. I appreciated your talk very much. Thank you, sir. And uh, you made good points. The thing is about uh, intellectualism and practice. In our country, you know, how much corrupt it is, yeah. whereas our Vedantic thoughts and philosophy is totally different. And how can this change be? Uh, how can this change, as you are uh, trying to inspire, can be brought about that you know, this corruption and practice should be the same as your philosophy? It should not be like what the state of affairs is in India today. Sure. If you have any solution or thoughts? I'll go back to what Gandhiji said. Change begins with oneself. So one has to change one's own consciousness. And, uh, and you know, and I was reading uh, something from Sri Aurobindo today. And he also says that in order to change the external circumstances, the internal change must happen. It is basically the cultivation of that inner change which will transform what is on the outside. So I would say that as a nation, we would want to go back to doing sadhana first and then transforming. Because there's a lot of muck and in order to enter, enter that muck and come out clean, one needs to have a very strong sadhana. Otherwise that muck will consume. 
that individual. So, we're talking of individual effort. I'm talking of the, these people who are, you know, the nation's politicians and People who are at the head of the uh, government and all. You are, we can do individual sadhana ourselves, and say we can transform ourselves like Vivekananda says, first change yourself. But you know, I'm talking of the general, uh, you know, establishment of this. So ultimately, you know, it basically becomes, uh, becomes the chicken and the egg problem, right? The, the kind of people, you know, who are ruling us are also the people whom we have sent to the parliament, right? So ultimately it is, it becomes our responsibility. You know, things can happen in different ways. We can start from outside and move within, or we can focus on the interior and transform the outside. You know, these are two different ways and it completely depends upon, you know, the, uh, the proclivity of an individual whether from where that individual wants to start. If one feels that, you know, that one can uh, remain focused on the outside and by being on the outside, one will gradually move within, you know, that is his or her calling and that should be respected as well. Personally, I would say for me, it is important, you know, to basically make my own fortress strong before I can come outside and think about transforming the world. But yes, transforming without is extremely important. And if we only remain focused on transforming within, the change which we are seeking in India, that will not happen. So I agree with you. Do you have an example like Gandhi, you know, he transformed the whole of India, he mobilized it. And uh, there have been other you Purushas, uh, Krishna, Ram and all that. But uh, we have examples, but what is the solution for this present thing? It doesn't seem to go away. It's the same. Sometimes emulating the, the great ones, sometimes carving one's own path. Ultimately, it is, it is that, sir. Ultimately, it has to be focused on one's own Purushartha. Whether that Purushartha is on the outside, or it is within. But it is, it has to be dependent on one's Purusharta. There is no other way. Thank you. Thank you, sir. A couple of scattered thoughts, a uh, few observations, and then a supplementary question. Sure. So, um, I think you talked about polytheism, monotheism. It surprises to me that the academia has so far, or the harming so far has failed to depict the progression of Brahman to Ishtadev in some sort of a pyramidic like picture and explain the concept. So just an observation to share with that. Second thing is you talked about uh, Rajiv Malhotra. Rajiv Malhotra talks about the Greeks, the reasoning, the Romans, the lack of reasoning. We all know about the Zoroastrians who had a whole lot more reasoning than the Greeks did. And we then like to believe that the Indian civilization had a whole lot more even than the Zoroastrians. So if you were to put it on a map going from east to west, you see this decline in reason all the way until it reaches Rome where there is no reason and ultimately they had to adopt the Magna Carta of the Greeks to, to, to come up with their governance system. So my observation is that when you say something like in crucifixion of Jesus, there was crucifixion of the spirituality, I think that's something to be researched even further. I, I think there's something behind it. Uh, second observation is that I think you, you did not talk about a very important uh, dichotomy and that is the dichotomy of... <coughs> Too many questions. Can I take one? Take, can I take them one by one? Sure. Otherwise, you know, I'll get okay. lost in okay. the web of the questions. But all those questions are very important, Rajivji. So, you know, uh, one by one. So the first one, <coughs> you were saying that uh, polytheism has not really been explained from the Vedantic <laughs> perspective as yet. You know, when I look at uh, the academia at this point in time, it may be very surprising to you, I see a poverty of thought. Why do I say this? You know, you have a certain section of academia which is engrossed 
in the perspective of modernism or modernity. It looks at the world in one particular way. Then there is another section, you know, which is entrenched in postmodernism. These are two systems of thought, right? Now, if the postmodernists, if they would have really taken their thought a little further, they would have been able to transcend the thought themselves. But they have not been able to apply, they have not been able to take that recourse. They have not taken thought to such a level where thought itself begins to reveal a very different kind of world. That hasn't happened. So in a certain sense you can say that, you know, they are fanatics of a particular kind. Fanatics, you know, who believe in the supremacy of thought and reason. And they are not able to look beyond that. And this world, you know, which we are talking about, it basically transcends thought and reason. So until unless you have gone into that realm, until unless you have experienced that realm, how is it that you will be able to analyze thought critically? So the critical examination of reason and thought, that itself has not happened. And even when it happens, you know what happens is that it gets swung in favor of emotions. Reason gets demonized and emotions you know, get privileged. So that is the problem. So two things. One is that the transcendence of binaries and dualities doesn't happen. And the second thing is that a critical examination of thought does not happen. And these are two huge limitations which have actually stopped intellectuals from really exploring uh, a world which is extremely substantial when you, when you look at the reports of rishis and sages. Does that address your question? The second one was related to uh, the, the, the transfer of reason. You know, we cannot say that reason did not exist in, uh, in Greece. You know, if you, if you really look at how reason is conceptualized in today's world, it was basically Aristotle's law of excluded middle, you know, which sort of uh, um, conceptualized or uh, um, coagulated reason and logic. So definitely, you know, reason and logic has been there, uh, you know, in, 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 in the Greek world. When it comes to Zoroastrianism, you know, I haven't read Zoroastrianism sufficiently to make a pronouncement actually. But there is one thing which I definitely do know, that there has been a lot of influence, a lot of Indian influence on the Greek thinkers. I can almost say with certainty that Plato was influenced by the Indian ideas. You know, he's definitely been influenced by the Upanishadic ideas when he, when he talks about the cave metaphor and, uh, and the horse metaphor. So when you look at those two metaphors, you know, you can definitely say that he was familiar with, uh, you know, Bhagavad Gita or one of the Upanishads. That is definitely a certainty. Um, you know, Pythagoras, uh, it is said, traveled to India. It is also said that Plato traveled to India. So there are definitely, you know, some murmurs here and there in academia, uh, which we find uh, stating that some of these profound Greek philosophers had direct contacts with India. And of course, when Alexander was there, through the gymnosophists, you know, um, the contact actually became even more prominent. As far as the migration of reason is concerned, I personally hold that India is an older civilization. And it is not only an older civilization, but it was also a very profound civilization, despite the records that we have from the Western thinkers. And if water flows from higher level to lower level, it is quite possible that the influence happened from India, 
you know, to this part of the world that we are talking about rather than the other way around. You know, I was talking initially in the talks, um, <clears throat> I also stated that, that certain fictions have been created. So this fiction of Greek, or rather the Greeks, you know, um, basically giving birth to everything which is of civilizational value has to be critically examined as well. Your third question? Uh, third question was around, uh, so you talked about lots of dichotomies, but not the dichotomy of simplicity and complexity. Um, that was a very interesting exclusion. But the reason I bring that up is, if we look at India with a billion people, if we look at the United States with 400 million people, um, what is the interweaving of simplicity, complexity, duality, and governance? And where does that leave the simplicity of the Greeks versus the complexity of the Vedantic or the Dharmic philosophies and the future? In other words, said otherwise, how can you expect a country like India in the 21st century with a billion people to live and govern itself with the complexity that we have in our traditions? You know, I would critically examine the question itself, Rajivji. Uh, my, my first critical examination would be that you are framing the question itself in a dichotomy. The dichotomy of simplicity and complexity, whereas you are ascribing complexity to India and, simpli and simplicity you know, to the Greeks. From, I would, the, from the legal perspective. Yeah, I would see it from a different perspective, you know, from a metaphysical perspective. I would say that there is a space where the dichotomy of simplicity and complexity gets transcended and included. And once that transcendence actually happens, there is a very profound lucidity which unfolds as a process. So despite the fact that there is complexity in the Indian thought, when you wade through it, there's a profound simplicity. There's a beautiful simplicity. You know, it's so simple that you can basically take the entire complexity within your own being and just walk around not feeling the weight of it. My understanding is that when we begin to explore that philosophy, that cosmology, we will be able to put that cosmology in practice as well, as it was done in the yonder years. For instance, when you look at Arthashastra, it is not that Arthashastra is divorced from the larger Indian cosmology which was present at that point in time. It was absolutely intimately connected, right? So in a, in, in a very similar sense, when we are able to cut through this colonial fiction which has been created for us, then we will not only be able to get into the cosmology which has been given to us by our sages, we will also be able to apply that cosmology in day-to-day -day life. So the first thing in my understanding is to basically recover that cosmology. The application will become very, very simple and lucid. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the uh, So my observation based on what you said about the colonization is that um, we are basically living in a Western defined world, whether it is in terms of achievement, uh, professional achievement, academic achievement, military achievement, economic achievement, um, social achievement, whatever it is, it's the best that has defined the parameters and we are trying to measure up to those parameters. Yes. Uh, and when you talked about decolonization, it seemed to me that you are mentioning, you are saying that India should define those parameters in our own way. and probably the rest of the world might follow it. But I really like the way that China has asserted itself in terms of these parameters. They've actually beaten the West in their own parameters. Whether you look at military or economy or, you know, even today if you look at science, there are many Chinese scholars who are publishing in Western journals. 
and that's how Chinese science is being respected. So, do you think that's a better way, at least in the short term, for India to be able to rise economically, rise militarily, rise everywhere else, according to Western parameters? And once we gain that kind of influence in the rest of the world, then we can start talking about our own way of doing things. Because otherwise, if we <coughs> completely not focus on those parameters, we may never be able to get the influence that we deserve. And right now, I do strongly believe or I fear that India's influence in the world is very minimal. Though we think that we are a billion population and so on, its influence in global affairs is hardly anything. And today, when Modi talks about all these initiatives that he is doing, it doesn't go beyond India's borders. And that's the, that's the tragedy of it. You know, I'll actually take a leaf from, uh, or rather a leaf out from, Sri Aurobindo's writings. Sri Aurobindo says that Every civilization, every culture, every nation has a soul and it is important for that particular nation to remain true to its soul. So at this point in time, you know, I would not say that it would be uh, beneficial for us to be following the example of China. Let China do, you know, what it's doing. That's number one. Number two, I'm not an expert on China and because I'm not an expert on China, I really do not know what's going on, what's happening in China. So for me, you know, to basically draw a comparison between India and China will be akin to skating on a thin ice. And as an individual who takes his scholarship very seriously, I would not get into the territory of making a comparison at this point in time. In the future, if you know, if I get interested in China, if I if I am able to understand uh, the ways of China, uh, maybe I'll be able to comment. But as far as India is concerned, you know, I, I, I think that India suffers from two problems. You know, it is not only the influence of Western cosmology. My understanding is that Western cosmology is one thing and Western colonization is another thing. Western colonization has happened or it has come out of Western cosmology, but it also is a, is a distortion of Western cosmology. So at this point in time, a two-pronged approach is important. The first one leads to understanding Western cosmology and the second one is to really understand how Britain basically impacted India and maybe you know sometime in the future I'll come up with another presentation I'm uh, I'm actually researching this topic uh, the hypothesis is this that Britain first created those fictions about India and then through the tremendous power which it was yielding over India it transformed Indian culture and Indian life in a very, very significant way. In fact, it, it created India out of its own imaginations. And those imaginations today are not just imaginations, they are realities, they are living realities. So that is another thing which I'm exploring. You know, this is, this is, this is one, of, uh, one of the theorems, uh, one, of, one of the 12 theorems that I spoke about. It will take me some time, you know, to, 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 to really research that. And if I find some substance there, then I'll probably come back and make another presentation. Kunji, so uh, something related to just what you said. Yes. So uh, first, one, first thing is, since Edward says Orientalism, uh, at least his theory at least took into account both India, exact, uh, the theory that he laid out had examples from India also, not just the Middle East. But then ultimately, the theory has benefited Middle East so much in terms of uh, uh, the discourse and everything. The sympathy because of uh, the definition of Orientalism itself has uh, helped Middle East so much, but has hardly helped India in that, in the sense that post-colonial studies has completely been uh, 
has been not been sympathetic at all to India, whereas it's been very sympathetic to the Middle East. Although Orientalism has been built with examples from India itself, as well as from the Middle East, Egypt and other places. So, uh, like even for example, the latest one is like the creation of this Islamophobia. So, people are okay with being is, uh, in the sense Hinduphobic, but then being Islamophobic is very wrong. So, how do you see this discourse? I have one more question which I let me think aloud on this one. There were two thinkers who influenced Edward Said in a very big way. Um, this is a hypothesis at this point in time. You know, I haven't I haven't read a direct record of that, but when I read uh, these two thinkers that <coughs> who precede uh, Edward Said, Amy Sasser and Albert Memi then I find that there has been a significant influence of these two thinkers on Sayyid. That's point number one. The second, the second point is that these thinkers, these two thinkers, uh, Memi and uh, Sasser, they have been talking about the conflict between Marxists and, uh, and nationalists. So this, this dichotomy between leftist and, and uh, um, and, 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 and nationalist is quite age old if you really look at it. I think what happened was that for India the entire post-colonial discourse got hijacked by the Marxists whereas for the Middle East it remained in the hands of the, nation, in the nationalists. And because the Islamists and Marxists have been in cahoots with each other, basically they have supported each other's writings also. Does that answer your question? Does that, does that make sense? It is basically because of the divide between the Marxists and the nationalists, which has been at the core of post-colonial thinking right from the very beginning. Sure. And one more question is, uh, one of the binaries, of course, um, is in the political. Of course, there are a lot more binaries, I suppose. Yeah, in yeah. the political realm, the left-right binary, yeah. for example. Uh, any comments on that? That's a very good point. You know, I wanted to talk about it. I forgot in the, in, in, in the process of giving this talk. You know, I, I think the Hindus should never accept the categorization or, as, or, uh, or ascription of right on them. Why do I say that? The whole thought is beyond binaries. It is beyond left, right, right, wrong, true, false, or any kind of binary which you may conceptualize. But it not only transcends it, it also includes it. In fact, you know, there are four stages involved in the transcendence of binaries. The first one is recognition of binaries. You first recognize that binaries exist. The second one is to see the interdependence interdependence between halves of every binary. When you start recognizing the interdependence, that is when you begin to transcend the binary. The fourth stage is when you transcend and integrate the binaries. So because the entire Hindu thought has been beyond binaries right from the very beginning, the Hindus in their wildest dreams should not accept the categorization of right coming from any corner of the world. You know, we should always desist that tap. We should always resist it. Does that answer your question, Yaji? Yeah. Due to the lack of time, uh, we would like to uh, stop taking any further questions, but don't hold off your question. Just one quick one. Okay. So, I think we've, we've talked at a very academic level and deep discussions have gone down that, that path, but from an individual perspective, so one who is actually not 
associated with Kerry in, in any way. Where does one start to uncover these? Is there, is there literature? Is there programs? Are there uh, you know, some, something available for folks who want to actually start reading up on this? And, and start? You know, the, um, the content of this talk um, is quite original, actually. The Divine has been very kind to me uh, in that particular way. There are people, you know, who have spoken about binaries, but how the binaries actually operate, you know, um, they have just come to me uh, gradually, and I, I feel that, you know, that there is a larger force, you know, which is supporting this process. So there is nothing written on it as yet, but there will be lots which will be written in the future. Because when I start applying this on philosophy, that is when I will start basically uh, <clears throat> critically examining Western cosmology. And my goal basically is to uh, liberate the Indian thinking by looking at Western cosmology in a critical way. So there will be, there will be literature which will be available. You know, but unfortunately, there isn't any. Uh, however, if you really want to understand uh, the Indian culture from within, there is a there is a wonderful book by my guru. And when I say this, I'm not promoting my guru. Uh, you know, he's very dear to me, but you know, but that's only restricted to my own heart. But it's a wonderful book. It's called The Foundations of Indian Culture. It has been rechristened as Renaissance in India and other races. Uh, this book is available, you know, you would want to read this. It's a wonderful, wonderful explanation of the Indian culture from within. In fact, you know, he begins by addressing the colonialist discourse which was prevalent in his times. That would be great. So again, at an individual level, you know, you can experience it. It's, it's been part of the tradition within the family. You get things passed on generations, but then to evolve this thought book, that, that's, uh, that's really good. Yeah, I, you know, honestly, I think that we'll need an army of scholars to do this. An army of scholars who are willing to work with each other with a lot of profundity. You know, by keeping the best of Indian traditions in their actions and in their hearts. Then only we'll be able to accomplish this. This task is huge. You know, we are, we are looking at 1,000 years of colonization. It's not a mean task. But it must happen. You know, I, I really hope that in my lifetime, I do not remain one of the scattered voices, you know, who said some important things in some remote corner of the world. My dream basically is to get together a body of scholars, you know, who in different ways are working towards a common project of decolonizing this field. The knowledge system at this point in time is heavily colonized.